Gabby Estoris, it is so lovely to have you on the show today. Welcome to Succession Stories. Thank you for having me, Lori. Look, I was looking forward to be with you today. We are both in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. That's how we met. And I feel so fortunate to have met you recently at a conference. And when we were talking, it became very clear to me how impressive and successful you have been in your career. And you're doing some very exciting things now that you are uh, an investor. So you're a successful entrepreneur. I want to mention for the audience, you're one of a few women in STEM who has not only bootstrapped her company to a successful exit, you've done that twice. And that is amazing. I can't wait to hear your story. Why don't we dive in with your first company, which was called eBilling Hub. And I think this is a super interesting story because you innovated in a space legal, right? That was a very mature and is a very mature industry, very well established. But this is an innovation story for legal tech and your first firm was eBilling Hub. Can you give me the background? I'm so curious to learn more. Yes, absolutely. So I out of I came a little bit of my background, uh, Lori, and uh, I like to say I'm originally from Venezuela, uh, Caracas. And uh, I like to say that, uh, and I think I always say the same, but I think it's funny. I came to the United States for two years, 26 years ago. So <laughs> I, I never left. You never and, left. Uh, so I had the opportunity to go to the University of Pittsburgh to do my master's degree in information science. And then I was hired by a large law firm, one of the largest uh, law firms in insurance defense. And insurance defense is well known by the amount of cases. Uh, we're talking about uh, pretty much 20 years ago uh, and they have this need, this new thing, uh, electronic billing uh, was a new thing. Basically um, law firms, they needed to submit all their invoices through a channel. Uh, imagine like an EDI, but for law firms and uh, with some sort of uh, parameters and rules to get the bills, not in paper, but in electronic format. So it was very nascent uh, a concept. And uh, so part of the reason why they hired me is because at the, at the time they have thousands and thousands of bills that needed to go electronically that someone was typing by hand to in an in a electronic format, right? So I kind of like, I did a lot of research, uh, Lori, and I couldn't find anything. In my background, I'm a software engineer, right? And just by the fact that you can write code, I call it, you get some superpowers, right? Um, so I develop uh, the solution, a little bit of my background, even though that I'm a software engineer, my specialty was in building in-house solutions. So I build this great solution uh, for the law firm, uh, adding a lot of value. And I always have this uh, entrepreneur uh, in me since I was little. So I said, there is a commercial, there is a huge opportunity here that we need to go after. So I went to my boss, uh, he, an amazing um, uh, person, an amazing lawyer. He passed away and, uh, and he was one of my greatest mentor. And he said, Gabby, absolutely, you can do this commercially and uh, as long as you don't leave the firm, right? Because uh, do your thing, right? And, uh, you know, and, and we want to retain you. So I was at the firm for 10 years. So that speaks a little bit of uh, the bond that we had and, and the amazing place they were to work for. So a little bit of that, uh, Lori. So we agreed that I could do something uh, commercial, but they, uh, there was a lot of trust, right? But I don't think to your point of innovation, I don't think they saw these as a real opportunity, right? It was a little bit like, a, hey, Gabby wants to do this, right? We cannot afford to lose her, knock yourself out and have a passion project, right? So um, I didn't have uh, any kind of like a, a legalities around that, right? So, I mean, pretty much all the invention was myself, but we kind of like, uh, when things were a little bit getting more serious, right? I went to my boss and said, I think, uh, you know, we need to 
uh, do this a little bit more serious. And I said, yeah, whatever, right? Give us a little bit of a percentage, right? Uh, whatever, it's fine, right? So uh, they let me continue doing the company. Lori and I met uh, in, in grad school, I met my business partner who came to be my husband of 20 years. And because he knew, he also was a, a PIT, he was a, a software engineer, neural networks at PIT. He knew how to build commercial software. So we kind of like a partner, we're gonna build commercial software, right? We're gonna take these. And my boss was, yes, that's fine, right? So a little bit of that, uh, I continued to work in for the firm and that uh, Danny left uh, his job uh, at the University of Pittsburgh. And uh, so, you know, we, that's how we started. That is incredible. I have to rewind on just a few things to just underscore. I worked in a law firm for a few years and I understand the dynamics. There's a lot of paper, right? Especially if this is, what year was this? This was 2000. Um, 2000, 2000, 2002. 2002. So we have to put ourselves back in time. There's a lot of paper moving. There's a lot of dollars at stake. What you did was you identified some pain points. If we look at the market need, your market, you had a captive audience for a pilot. You found product market fit in the law firm. You know, you created a, you knew that there was pain. You knew that there was value. And then you created a product that how many lawyers, roughly a hundred plus? Yeah, like um, uh, back probably 150, 200. Yes. So you could develop this product, commercialize the product kind of, right? Within the law firm, prove it out. And then <laughs> you were given the latitude to go commercialize the software yes. platform. That's amazing. Yes. And, and, I, and I am ad- ad- admiring not only the law firm's, um, I guess, willingness to support that for the, they found it effective internally and they used it, but then also to give you that latitude to run with it and give you the, uh, that took a lot of time. I mean, how did you, how did you, Gabby, how did, how did you do that? You were managing a startup as well as maintaining your role at the law firm. Yes, and uh, totally. Um, I, 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 I was so passionate about, you know, solving this problem, building this company, right? And uh, I'm very passionate about the, the, the challenges that I had at a law firm, right? that I didn't feel it, uh, Lori, like it was a chore, right? It was, uh, I mean, I was doing what I love to do, right? And, uh, you know, I think uh, when you're doing what you love, right? I mean, it's like, a, you know, that saying that you're not working, right? And I felt that way. And even uh, fast forward 20 years uh, after or more, I don't feel like uh, I was working. I was just having fun. <laughs> it's incredible. <laughs> so when you spun it out and, and, at some point you found it was time to sell. How did you know when it was time to sell and what were some of the deal dynamics with the, I think it sold to us, I'd call it a strategic buyer. I don't know if you ended up talking to financial buyers as well, but maybe you could just share a little bit about that time, play, that time frame and what was happening. Yeah, so a little bit of, uh, I mean, the, it, it was a very interesting process. Uh, I mean, we were super young, I mean, this is 20 some years ago, right? And uh, it ended up being that uh, one of the partners of the law firm, right, saw the opportunity and got for a little uh, tiny piece, bought the interest of the law firm, right? So the law firm uh, kind of like uh, went away, right? And we had a partner, right? Um, that I was retiring in our At the beginning, right, we were super excited, right? Uh, It's gonna open these many opportunities, right? But our interests were not aligned. Uh, I mean, we were building something revolutionary. And even Lori, I mean, this is back in 2000, 2002, the word SaaS was not even invented yet, right? So remember that in 1999, 2000, Salesforce put the word SaaS. So we were calling our solution application service providers, right? Right. Now we were the first SaaS for law firms. Uh, There was already SaaS 
for these civil inventors getting the bills, but we were the first one, right? So, uh, I mean, we knew the size, the amount of the opportunity, right? And, uh, and, you know, he was pretty much retiring. We were starting pretty much our entrepreneurial journey. And, uh, you know, and we grew, once we kind of like a find this uh, market fit, and kind of like a let me make a parenthesis, it took us about three to four years to make our 40 first customers. And then uh, after we partnered with Thomson Reuters and, you know, there is some drama there, uh, we got our next 100 customers in a year. I wow. Mean, totally a hockey stick, right? And, uh, and you know, we gener started generating a lot of revenue, right? Uh, we were already uh, very, very profitable. And uh, so our interests were not aligned. We wanted to keep it going. Uh, he wanted to catch out, right? And, uh, and pretty much uh, we sold too early, in my view. Really? But it was a, but it was a great uh, journey. We learned a lot, right? But, um, but yeah, so. And it sold to a division of Thomson Reuters, is that correct? It was a Thomson Reuters legal. Okay. Right. So we should probably just share, I mean, Thomson Reuters in the legal space is, is the 800 pound gorilla. They exactly. are dominant and they have a lot of uh, great software that law firms use. Yes. And you had a partnership with them. Was that a strategic move? Did you envision at some point that they might be the acquirer because of that partnership? Yes. And that, yeah, Lori, but a little bit of um, kind of like, um, uh, let me tell you a little bit about the journey to get there, right? Because it sounds very romantic, right? Yeah, we did a partnership, right? They were interested and they bought us, right? A little bit of, um, we knew that we have something incredibly innovative. So um, I went uh, to talk to the CIO of Thompson Reuters Legal uh, to look for a partnership. And uh, he was so impressed uh, with that. I pretty much, you know, very naive. I kind of like spilled all this secret sauce, right? And, uh, and, you know, you could see, right, that they were not figuring this problem out the way we did, right? And uh, so he said, yeah, Gabby, it's incredible what you're doing. I would love to partner with you, right? So, I mean, we were incredibly static, right? I mean, hey, this 800 pound gorilla, you know, is partnering with the little guys, right? Right. So then they went silent, Lori. It was, uh, uh, you know, two weeks they don't respond, three weeks they don't respond, right? So I'm continue, you know, my outreach, my outbound and nothing happens, right? So the next thing that we knew is when I saw a press release, they had launched a competitive product. Oh, wow. That is so incredible. We hear about that. We hear, you know, it's like the mythical unicorn animal and, and you hear this story and now, wow, you actually encountered that. Because I say to the people, what matters the most is the conversation, not necessarily when you're in the room, but when you leave the room, they're trying to figure out if they could replicate what you do. That's exactly what it is, right? So, I mean, you're not gonna, if they can figure it out, we can too, right? So, I mean, it's kind of like a playbook, uh, Lori. So they're gonna try because of course they have pretty much unlimited resources and they have pretty much unlimited access to great talent, right? How come we're not gonna do it, right? So, so what happened was, right? I was devastated, totally devastated. So my business partner, Danny, said, you know what, Gabby, this is great. It is great because if they're able to try to copy what we're doing, that it's a proof that they know how to do this, right? So what we need to do is we're going to beat them in the market because the playbook is they're going to try to do it, right? You start taking customers, they don't do it as nimble or as a innovative the way you can do it. And, and the reason is it's a we make decisions faster, right? And we're only focused solving what problems while they have, you know, this many departments, this many products, right? And, and, and so we have a, let's call it an unfair advantage, right? So we, we knew, Lori, that they, it was impossible for them 
to do something better than ours, right? Not with all the resources, because we were thinking how to fix this problem day in and day out, right? So we said, okay, we're gonna beat them in the market. And that's what happened, right? They paralyzed the market, right? Because when they announced it, okay, so we go, I mean, it's like a no, that saying nobody got fired on buying from IBM, exactly right. the same thing, right? Right. So, and, right. We have uh, early adopters, right? People that understood that they couldn't innovate the way we did, right? And we start getting our lighthouse accounts, right? And that once we got, you know, another 40 out of their uh, portfolio, their solution wasn't selling as great as it was, right? They say, okay, let's partner. And once ah, we partner- Okay. Yes. So how much time did it take for them to launch? Uh, about about six to a month. Uh, so in that the- time, it was also probably a good marketing for your company because they were validating that this was a worthy service and you were already established in the market. Yes, yes, yeah. And it was some more mature, right? We had a library of uh, Evelyn templates, right? And uh, so, yeah, but, but it, it's a playbook, right? They're going to try to do it, right? You beat them in the market because now we earn the place, right, to partner with them because uh, there was no risk. The product was already in one of the largest uh, law firms in the world, right? And then, so we did an OEM, but not only once we came with tons of Reuters, right, Adderan and some other uh, um uh, Robert Tech, right, and some other practice management system came uh, came along, right. So we have these um, uh, incredibly uh, relationships, not with Johnson but with the others, right. And what happened was uh, it opened the doors to really scale this. So uh, I mean, it really, really worked. So because even though that they say we're going to sell your product, right, and probably this is something for the audience. So when you go into a reseller or an OEM mode, right? I mean, it's great on the ability to open doors, but nobody's going to sell your product. Nobody is going to carry the message the way you do. So uh, yes, they were kind of like a a broker. And uh, once they kind of like uh, generating the leads within the law firms, right? We will go and do the sale. So we needed to give him, you know, a high percentage, typically when you do these resellers and OEM, right? And also we had a, a sales force to deploy to maximize, right, the, the, the success rate of our um, deals. Makes sense. So they, they, it, was a, it was a lead generation arrangement right. because they were cross-selling and then they got a percent of the sale, but right. your sales team were the ones who would close. Yeah, and do the demos and do all and the, do the demos yeah, and everything. Yeah, that's process. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. No, I, it, that's important. And did you have to spell all of that out in the partnership agreement? Ah, uh, no, no, no. We kind of like I learned that along the way. And okay. uh, the biggest lesson is uh, when you do this reseller, uh, their 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 sell force, uh, they they have a bag of products, and your product is one in the bag. Right. So, how do you differentiate yourself? Right. So, we kind of like became an advocate in support of their self force, basically. What and does that mean? Yeah. So, for example, we will provide all the uh, messaging, right? All the marketing material, and we try to control the sales process, right? Uh, so, we had a, a, a team just to do the demos uh, for them. So, they, they didn't have to learn it. And, uh, and we were very passionate, right? Which is hard to convey. So uh, we, we made the most out of uh, the relationship and it worked so well that we replicate the same with the other OEMs and partnerships that we did. So you not, so it wasn't exclusive. It wasn't you, exclusive. Okay, so that's also yeah. important. Yeah. And then at what point, I want, you mentioned earlier, you had a, another, um, owner of the business. So it was yourself, your, your partner, your husband. And then there was another individual mm-hmm. who influenced a sale. Yes. Can you talk about that dynamic? Because I think that that's pretty interesting. What was that? Can you go a little bit deeper? Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> and, and again, we learn a lot. Um, but um, one of the things that we learned, it's that uh, we were so excited of doing these um, partnership with his partner, right? Or, or 
you know, uh, let's say, yeah, a partner that uh, we um, didn't go deep into the legalities of the arrangement, right? So the, the, our legal structure and our legal arrangement was, arrangement was very, very loose, right? And, uh, and then we were not savvy enough in terms of valuations and all that, right? So, you know, he was a savvy uh, litigation lawyer, right? And um, so he had an advantage on negotiating, um, you know, to their favor, right? So, um, yeah, we pretty much uh, were forced uh, to sell. And, uh, you know, because of the, the, the lack of, uh, legal structure uh, to protect us. Interesting. And so the lesson learned there for a founder who wants to bring on an investor would be to really make sure that they have an attorney who is thinking through their interests. Yeah, right. Because I mean, he was the one that we trusted to look for our interest. And, uh, it, it, you know, we were naive. Right. So, yeah. yeah, you gotta you gotta have someone that is going to look for your interest. Gotcha. Yeah. So time. So time to sell. There was that dynamic. And how did you decide that you wanted to sell and who to sell to? Did you approach did you approach Thompson writers and say, look, we you know, we think we're a great fit. Are you interested in buying us? Did you go to Adirant and others as well? Yeah. So what happened was right, because, I mean, this solution was so unique. And we were even surprised that even after five, six, seven years, right, no one uh, in the industry will come up with a competitive product. So, I mean, the market was ours, right? So uh, the, the um, clients were ours, right? And, uh, and, you know, it became the leading solution in the world for eBellion. So what happened was, right, uh, Thomson Reuters, uh, approaches uh, other and pretty much everybody else kind of like approaches uh, to go a little bit more into um, even worth as uh, well as cooler. Um, you know, they, they we we became an acquisition target. Um, in you know from the usual suspects uh, already, so we knew uh, you know any of these uh, publicly traded companies. Uh, it, it we're going to be the, the target. And a little bit kind of like a, to summarize, right? So you have the idea, you innovate, they're going to try to do what you're doing because why not, right? You start getting the clients and they're going to buy you because, I mean, they are limited in the ability that they have to innovate, right? For example, Lori, by the time that they would have to get a business case approved, right? We already had two versions of the software out, right? Right. And uh, so, and, and they know that, right? But they gotta, you gotta prove yourself, right? And then you become an acquisition target. And that's what we did. Right, gotcha. And so did you have any outside help at this point? Did you hire an intermediary to help, you know, you're still running your company day to day and this is gonna now take a lot of time or did you run point yourself? We, we, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, it was a little bit kind of like um, um, in, the first time around, it was incredibly flattering, right? That you have, I mean, these uh, many uh, unsolicited offers, right? And uh, at that point, we didn't think about uh, an investment banker or, or anything like that, right? I mean, this is something that we can do, right? We know a bunch of lawyers and, uh, and, 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 and we will do. So yeah, it was a very... Uh, organic and ill <laughs> thought out, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> and how long did the process take from when you were getting the unsolicited offers to actually closing? Yeah, it was uh, probably at the six to nine months. Okay, pretty pretty long process. And yeah. it was, um, was it, a, can we talk about the deal itself? Because what were you doing in revenue roughly around that time? Um, I mean, top line, uh, we were uh, probably about six or seven. Okay. So and and it was a 100% SaaS recurring revenue business. So I'm assuming you sold at a multiple of revenue and you were negotiating multiples of revenue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And, yep. uh, and, and every vertical has their own range, right? Yeah. Uh, based on growth, right? Based on revenue, right? Uh, based on EBITDA, right? 
and uh, in in there it's very consistent across the board. Uh, yeah, in, in this industry. So you don't have to disclose what the multiple was, but sometimes in this industry it's 10x. So it can be a pretty sizable, you know, pretty sizable number for for companies. And there's reasons to be above or below some of those benchmarks, of course. What were some of the main dynamics that you found in the negotiation? Did they want you to stay on and, and have an earnout? Was it the founders were out at closing? What were some of the things that were important to you or important to them? Yeah, I mean, the first experience it was very uh, difficult experience, right? And uh, we it was uh, there was litigation involved. So uh, part of the deal was, uh, I mean, we're not coming over uh, the, the transition. And uh, because of um, the conditions were, like I said, we were not aligned, right? Okay. And, uh, and we, we learned a lot, but yeah, so it was a different kind of like um, acquisition because it was, uh, there was litigation involved. There was litigation between your firm and Thomson Reuters? In the, in the, no, in the, our partner. Oh, 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 excuse me. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Yes. Gotcha. And, uh, yes. I so, see. Okay. So it, it you were, <clears throat> how did you feel when the day came and it, the, the closing? Did, did you feel excitement? Were you sad? Were you, because this is your baby. You'd been working with this oh, company. Yeah. You bootstrapped it with your husband. What, what were some of the emotions that you were feeling at the time? Yeah. I mean, it was, um, it, it, it was not good. I mean, it was uh, kind of like a sense of uh, loss. Um, but I mean, we knew, right, that uh, there is a better opportunity waiting for us, right? So this is our first attempt into this. Uh, we did that really well. And uh, let's take all our learnings, right, and do that better. And we did. So... Um, I think uh, in a way, uh, Lori, I, I don't regret any of the experiences other than have a better legal uh, framework around, yeah. right? But uh, everything else, right, it really made us stronger, right? Uh, we learned a lot that probably otherwise we would have not uh, learned, right? And with the second company, we pretty much engineer a company that we wanted to build and exit. And, uh, and we were very deliberate in the, how, uh, you know, gross margins were going to be, uh, EBITDA margins, growth, uh, recurrent revenue, right? And, uh, in, 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 yes, and every other metric, right? So, uh, for example, Lori, we understood that not every uh, revenue is good revenue, right? So we favor, you know, going 90, 90% for the recurrent, right? And that anything that was not recurrent, that was our uh, giveaway. Like, uh, you can discount to the salespeople, you can discount the set of fee, right? But we don't discount the recurrent revenue because we were evaluated on that. Right. So um, and we did it in about seven years, probably six, seven years. Uh, we grew that company, you know, to the point that we also became an acquisition target. That's incredible. So this is Bellafield Systems now. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you took some a little bit of time off between the two startups, but not much. Wasn't it about a year or two years? <laughs> yes, it was a year. Yes, exactly. a year. So you weren't prevented from working in, in the legal tech space. You weren't prevented from creating another entity. Uh, that was going to potentially <laughs> compete with Thomson Reuters. Yeah, so I mean, we were not prevented to, I mean, we were uh, prevented uh, from creating a very similar solution in that space. So um, so we couldn't create another e-billing or the like. So Bellafield was timekeeping. It was timekeeping. And um, yes, which... It's kind of like, um, I mean, it's very interesting, right? Because all lawyers have been keeping time, right? Since the, you know, 1940s, right? When the practice, you know, they realized and there is some history there, right? So, I mean, there was nothing really innovative there, right? So um, with the first company, we really created a market that didn't exist, right? right. 
uh, this one, it was already there, right? And a little bit on that, uh, Lori, when you create a market, uh, part of the challenge, what it took us a little bit longer is because we needed to educate the market to something that they never did, right? Kind of like a using a SaaS solution, right? To send deals electronically as opposed to printing and sending out, right? This one, uh, you know, they were already used to that, but um, what we did, it's bring innovation and in how they keep the, their time. So our first solution was the iPad. The iPad, when we came, um, we started seeing lawyers with iPads. We started seeing law firms buying iPads and they didn't know what to do with that, right? They were not apps. Uh, for iPads for legal, right? So they could use like a notability, right? And they could use their email, right? So we said, right, um, you know, uh, there is a huge opportunity. So let's do only timekeeping for iPads. That's it. And that's how it started. And then, hey, can you do it for the iPhone? Yeah, I think we can, right? And then how about Android? And uh, so the vision always was, right? We want to own the lawyer experience when it comes for them to recover in time. And we built a whole company that just started kind of like an anywhere mobile solution, right? Then we became a desktop solution anywhere. And then we put compliance into that. So, but Lori, we have this vision. We knew that we wanted to get the market out of the mobility and take the kind of like a ride the wave of Apple and the innovation. But we knew that there was a very, a uh, great vision behind it, right? In, the, in a, a much bigger game. So the compliance came about, right? So they could enter, let's say a, a, um, an entry, a time entry, right? And immediately it was gonna be validated. Okay, the client is not gonna pay for this, right? So immediately we had the intelligence, right? And the knowledge to, you know, make sure that everything that you put in was compliant. And we kind of like a pioneer uh, that as well. That's awesome. I, so many times we hear about tech that is tech first, and then it tries to solve a pain point. You understood the market really well. You understood the the law, the lawyers' workflow, and where they had ups and downs on in their day. And, and no one enjoys timekeeping. Let's face it. But it was the way we always do it. You found a pain point. You had market need, and you saw the opportunity to build and and differentiate, which is which is really incredible. So in this space, you were able to do it twice, <laughs> one around the, the electronic billing and one around the timekeeping. What's fascinating also, because I did spend a little bit of time, not as many years as you, but I did spend a couple of years in a law firm. And you know, lawyers are not really known for being super tech savvy. Now, of course, there's uh, the lots of people who are, so I'm not trying to generalize too much, but if we put ourselves back into this time period also, not typically early adopters of tech, right? Um, did you find that the training was was something that you had to think about for the users and their use cases, or was it just so easy to use and pick up that the lawyers just ran with it? Yeah, I mean, I love this question, right? Because I mean, it brings my passion <laughs> out, right? So something that we learned by being kind of like insiders, it's a uh, lawyers are incredibly smart uh, and, uh, and, and, and incredibly skilled because they speak for a living, right? They, they make deals for a living, right? So because of that, right, I always challenge uh, lawyers and accountants, right? Because I mean, we also had accountants uh, using our solution. They are not averse to technology they just averse to technology that is not easy to use, right? right? So our only thing is how can we make this incredibly simple for them? And that's how, you know, we grew so quickly. In 12 months, we already profitable. And, uh, you know, we already have like, a, I mean, 500 law firms uh, in two years, right? Wow. It was, it was because it was so simple, not only for the lawyer to use, but so simple to deploy uh, that a large law firm of 500 lawyers, they could be up and running in a day and a half, which was so part of uh, our mantra, it's how we can uh, remove resistance from the lawyers adopting the technology and from the IT uh, and, and operations department to implement it. 
makes a lot of sense. So a, a similar story here, because this company, the difference was you said you were building it to sell from the beginning. So there was probably a little less of an emotional attachment to Bellafield than there was to your first company, I'm guessing. But here you, in this situation, I think I heard you on an interview where you were on another show and you talked about, I think it was the, the Built to Sell show that you did with John Warlow. And you talked about hiring an advisor. And so now this is your second time around. You've been through it. Why didn't you say, oh, we can do this ourselves again? Yes, uh, that, that's an excellent question. So uh, in 2018, which was uh, one year prior uh, to the sale, uh, we got uh, three or four unsolicited um, offers and actually uh, term sheets and all that, right? And uh, I mean, the company was a lot bigger. Uh, there was a lot at stake. And, uh, and even though we were flattered, right? Um, so we kind of like decided, okay, let's entertain, let's look at that, right? Well, let's have some meetings. Um, <clears throat> but then we kind of like realized there is too much complexity here, right? So, you know, I was super focused growing the, you know, making our revenue goals, right? Growing the company and uh, that we say, okay, uh, I'm not ready to entertain any of these, right? So in 2019, because I mean, we were growing a lot, right? Um, so I decided to get um, investment banker to help us do an equity growth round. So we were not even thinking about um, selling it um, 100% yet, right? And part of the strategy was, uh, so we have a lot of time and, and energy and in everything invested in here that is wise to take some chips off the table. So uh, there was a lot of appetite from private equity uh, to do that. And uh, we kind of like uh, met every metric that uh, private equity that invests in SaaS, right? So we have the growth, uh, we have the revenue, we have the EBITDA, um, and we have this magic number that anybody can Google, right? But it was basically the ratio between revenue and, and, and marketing and sales. <clears throat> so we, we became very, very, uh, attracted to private equities, right? So, but because we knew the potential, we said, okay, so let's go ahead and shop around and let's find the best deal. Uh, I believe, Lori, that without our advisors, our strategic advisors, and our investment banker, we would never would have done the deal that we did. Never, never. And you ended up selling the whole company. And we end up selling. So, and uh, I cannot um, treasure enough the value that our strategic team and our investment banker brought to the table. And they earn every penny. Oh, and that's, do it again. that's amazing. So did you go into this with an expectation of uh, annual recurring revenue multiple? And I know I said 10X earlier, and that's probably much higher given your first company and the time period. So I'm guessing that that's not a number we want to anchor to, but in this scenario, um, was it somewhere around that neighborhood? Was it less than that, that you thought you would sell for? I mean, we, we, we knew uh, the number, right? Because I mean, we knew the market, we already had a prior experience. So what happened, Lori, was uh, because of um, the, we closed the deal in 45 days. Wow. That's fast. And, uh, and with Thanksgiving in between, right? A couple of things to say to that, right? So uh, I was extremely diligent and organized. Um, and, and even everything was kind of like a by the book, Lori, in terms of, I mean, there are nothing obscure, right? There are no secondary set of books, right? There is no uh, messy operations, right? So it, it, it was a very um, uh, well-oiled machine, right? So when the investment bankers comes, right? So they didn't have to deal with, uh, okay, there is no contract here, right? I mean, uh, the company, you know, there is no uh, proper incorporation here, there, right? So they came in just to a value. It took us about a month and a half or two to get the story together, uh, you know, to get the book together. And once they have the book together, right, they were very, very effective 
in identifying potential um, um, partners, right? And uh, I remember when the first round, we get about, we got about 60 NDAs uh, interested in learning more. And then, you know, we started narrowing it down and we end up with 12 offers that were worth, worth considering. So what our investment banker, um, um, Brock Mathias and VRA in Atlanta, he created a very honest uh, bidding um, situation. Yeah. Right? And, uh, and one of the things that I was more impressed by, right, he will never influence my decision, right? He just presented the fact, right? So he never took any side, right? But he educated me to make the best decision, right? right. And I think with a, a great investment banker uh, shows, right? Because I mean, his job was supporting our organization, not making a decision for us, right? Yes, and by having a bidding process, you were probably able to get them to play against uh, off each other in a way that, as you said, it was it was honest. There's no, um, you know, that's part of the process when you have kind of an you know an auction, let's call it, where these different companies are interested in you and they're interested in getting a deal, and it's, and it's a negotiation. So there's always that room to perhaps for them to raise their prices and. And get to in a point where you say you say yes. So uh, I'm guessing that that worked out pretty <clears throat> well for you. And that's a little bit of what happened, right? We 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 knew that by getting the company to this with these KPIs, we knew the number, right? But thanks to this a competitive situation, right? Uh, we were blown away by the by the final offers. That's great. And, uh, but uh, Lori, something, and again, I'm I'm, I'm super passionate, I mean, kind of like uh, uh, going through this again, right? Because we were extremely lucky. So then we took these uh, 12 uh, offers to four and then to three. Uh, one of them was an strategic uh, buyer. The two of them, it was incredible private equities, right? That I have very dear to my heart. And then, uh, Lori, because you develop, you bond with these, right? You have an honest relationship with them, right? that it became extremely hard to make a decision, right? Because I mean, there was no wrong decision, right? Uh, each one will add enormous value uh, on their way, right? Uh, my husband and partner, he didn't even, he supported me also to make the decision, right? So, and uh, yeah, so I went to my advisors, right? I went to my executive coach uh, just to get a little bit of um, advice, right? And uh, in part of my decision-making framework, it's uh, all these are amazing uh, private equities, amazing companies, right? Just there is a win, right? But how do I feel that it's gonna be, my employees are gonna thrive, right? And uh, I already had a relationship with Roper and Adam, right? And uh, I mean, Adam had a female CEO, right? that I really respect and, and, and treasure. And uh, I think, I mean, there was so much respect and, uh, and so much trust that, you know, I knew that I wanted them to be my home. So it wasn't only about the highest bidder. In the, and they were in, we didn't take the highs. We didn't. That's super interesting. I've heard that as well. So almost again, like this, mythical thing you hear about and here we are that that was your situation that's fascinating so the culture of the company the prior relationship the fit for your employees you and your husband decided to probably not stay on I'm guessing but you wanted your team to have a sustainable future with this with this entity and so it was Adderant Roper yes and uh, and not only that right it's uh our values were absolutely aligned, Lori. Very different from our first experience, right? So when we came in into the negotiation, um, uh, Lori, and probably you're familiar because you've done this, you know, I mean, many, many times, right? We were all for a win-win, right? There were no shenanigans, right? There was no hidden, right? Every day we will come in to reviewing documents, right? And everybody was putting their best. Um, 
right? So we wanted to succeed. There was no chance in our mind that this deal was not going to go forward. That was not an option, right? So we kind of like uh, have to kind of like uh, overcome some hurdles, right? And uh, but kind of like uh, having the desire to really succeed at this transaction, it made it super easy. And kind of like uh, as the result, we close a deal in 45 days. That's amazing. And around Thanksgiving. Uh, that's just <laughs> incredible. Highly, highly motivated buyers. And kudos to you and your team for really being ready. And that that says that speaks volumes to the process because the more ready we are for a transition, the more options we're going to create. And your story 100% illustrates that point. I want to jump to what you're doing today because it fuels your passion and mission in a different direction. And after you sold, you took probably a little, you took like a week off, right? No, I'm kidding. You took some time (laughs) off, hopefully to enjoy. Did you do some travel? Uh, Well, uh, we were because, I mean, Danny and I were grinding uh, (laughs) for 20 years, right? And uh, yeah, uh, we decided to go to Europe for six months. And uh, we were set to go March 10th of 2020. And the next day it was a lockdown. So we couldn't go. So you uh, had a staycation. So <laughs> we, like the rest of us. <laughs> but it was, uh, but it was uh, I have no job because we already completed the, trans- the transition from December to March, right? Yep. With uh, Aaron and, and Robert, right? So I was pretty much uh, in my house, right? With my kids and uh, and without pretty much anything, anything that I knew and I love to do, I was not doing any of that. Yeah, that was a tough time. It was, uh, it, it was really tough, tough time. It was uh, super bittersweet, right? Yeah. And uh, in a little bit of kind of like a how the serendipity of life, right? So um, I became kind of like um, someone knew that I was available, right? And they say, well, you're a female founder, you're a minority founder, talk to Gabby, right? She just sold her company, right? And there was another. And uh, all of a sudden, I was advising uh, 10, 12 companies. Uh, amazing founders, amazing female founders. I started angel investing in them because I believe in in some founders uh, so much. And that led me to uh, be part of uh, a fund and become an LP of one fund, right? As I was doing the advising and then through this, I have the opportunity uh, to start my own fund, right? But it was kind of like a non-plan, right? It just happened, you know. Very organic. So the people organic. knew they started reaching out, and and interesting too because, as I said in your introduction, you bootstrapped your first two companies. You didn't have experience with venture capitalists; they weren't on your board. And now you are a VC, and it's an interesting juxtaposition, right? Because now yes. you're looking to support women in a industry, the field of venture capital, where they're just the percentages are pretty low, aren't they, for uh, VC VC investments going to women founders? It's like 2%, or some yeah, really yeah, low less, number. Less than 2% for female-led um, startup. Yes, it's, it, it, it's, very, it's, it's very sad. And on the other side, right, uh, on the VC, only uh, less than 12% are female making decisions on investments. So there, there, there's a long way to go, but uh, and yeah, and that's why I love so much uh, what I'm doing. So is how is so the name of the fund is is the fund XX. Mm-hmm. So there's a little bit of controversy about the name, I understand, but let's talk about that the the positioning of the fund and how you support women investors. And if we, uh, as listeners, are are hearing this and they're thinking about, oh, I know someone that might be a fit for talking with you or connecting with you, maybe give us a sense of the types of investors that the fund looks to uh, support. Yes, and uh, so um, in terms of uh, um, LPs and investors, uh, we are incredibly proud to say that 90% of our investors are female. And uh, 
you know, even uh, some very uh, qualified, uh, um, you know, people that didn't have the chance to be part of a venture fund before. So in a way, we're trying to democratize uh, the investment and be part of the VC investors community, right? And, uh, and, and again, and I think we're done something uh, that, you know, few others have done uh, in Pittsburgh, the Nexat Fund, Yvonne, right? I mean, we, we share um, uh, the same uh, philosophy, right? And that uh, they were also very successful in having female investors, right? But on the investment side, uh, as we deploy capital to our founders, uh, our you know, investment thesis is that uh, we want to support the next generation of female leaders. So we only invest in companies where the CEO is a, is a female. So that's kind of like a, we decided to draw a line on the sun, right? Because we want to support the leaders. And then uh, we participate in rounds that are between half a million dollar and a million and a half, right? Uh, because we invest in pre-seed and seed rounds uh, only. And, uh, and kind of like a lastly, uh, we look at the founders, Lori. Uh, do they have the DNA? Do they have the domain knowledge, right? Do they have the great and I like to say the integrity, right? Uh, to you know that that we want to support, and uh, and in addition to that, right? We want to we invest because we all uh, come from technology. Uh, we invest in tech-enabled companies that we believe, right, that can provide the returns that our fund seeks out. Excellent. And is this U.S. only? Uh, for now, it's U.S. only. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, that's that's excellent, and I'm so excited for you, Gabby. You are a wealth of knowledge, a ton of experience. I know there's a lot of things that inspire you, and you inspire so many. Is there a favorite quote that you turn to every now and then that to give you inspiration? Yeah, I think uh, I think it's even kind of like a little bit of a mantra, and it's from Aristotle, right? It's like um, it goes like uh, we are what we repeatedly do. So they, therefore, excellent, right, is not an act, it's a habit, right? And uh, I kind of like um, our culture in our two companies, it was, uh, you know, around excellence and respect for others. And, uh, you know, I believe that we can achieve great things when we try to put excellence in everything that we do. And that's I love that. I love that. that quote. I love that. Excellence is not an act. It's a habit. If people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to reach out? Uh, LinkedIn. I mean, there are not too many Gabriella stories uh, out there, right? So I'm, 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 I'm very easy to find. And uh, for any um, female founder, right, a minority founder that wants to reach out, right, um, I, I, I'm, I'm very accessible. So it's just a, don't be afraid to ask, just go and ask, okay? And if I can add value, right? And I'm passionate about what the founders are building, chances are that we are going to connect. I think I have some female founders to send your way. Please do. Please do. <laughs> I'll be connecting you. <clears throat> and Gabby, thank you so much for coming on Succession Stories and sharing your story with us. Thank you for having me. And I enjoy it thoroughly. Thanks. And so to the listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. You can always catch Succession Stories on any of your favorite podcast players or on YouTube. And don't forget to like and subscribe to the show. If you want to maximize the value of your business and plan for future transition, reach out to me for a complimentary assessment at meetlauriebarkman.com. Be sure to tune in next week for more insights from transition to transaction. And until then, here's to your success.